The White House has approved the FDA's new coronavirus vaccine guidelines. This is a reversal of position that comes after the New York Times revealed top White House officials blocked the FDA from publishing the guidance for two weeks. These recommendations for vaccine makers are stricter than previous guidance and makes it very unlikely that a COVID-19 vaccine will be approved before Election Day, something President Trump had been promising. For more on this, let's bring in Dr. Anita Ogden. She is an internal medicine specialist and immunologist. Uh, Dr. Ogden, uh, the president had been pushing to get a vaccine before the election. Doesn't appear that's going to happen right now. So what are these recommendations for the vaccine approval that the FDA lays out in its guidance? Good morning. Well, I'm so happy to hear that the FDA is moving ahead with strengthening the guidelines that would allow for emergency use authorization of a vaccine. I do fear that the president's trying to continually hijack a vaccine for the election or by election day is uh, the greater message that people are getting and that's leading to that vaccine skepticism. But what the FDA is saying now is that they're going to require uh, robust safety data on any of these vaccines before they can move ahead with emergency youth use authorization. So essentially they want two months of safety data in at least half of the study participants after the second dose. Now, we, the vaccines that we're looking at right now that are, you know, ahead in this game require two doses. Um, so Johnson & Johnson, which is only now starting phase three trials, is a, a one-dose vaccine. So really, they're trying to emphasize the safety data here. And um, what we know is that, you know, experts say that adverse events from vaccines typically occur within two to three months. So that two-month deadline is really uh, trying to be aggressive, but not overly conservative, so that we can still get the vaccine in a timely fashion. So we are seeing some reassurance here. Um, and I think the greater message here should be uh, people gaining more trust in the vaccine uh, and not having that you know, skepticism about uh, Trump and his administration trying to put politics ahead of the science. Um, let us pivot to the president and his COVID-19 diagnosis. He's back in the White House, spent a couple days in the hospital. Um, his doctors said that he's not out of the woods yet. Um, we are learning this morning that he's telling his doctors he doesn't seem to be experiencing any symptoms. But what is the sort of the typical treatment for a patient like Donald Trump during this phase of the illness? As best we can guess, uh, he started feeling symptoms maybe about a week ago. Yeah, you really hit on the point that we have, you know, so little data and information about how he's doing and when this all started. But typically what we see and we really, really want to be careful about in a high risk patient like Donald Trump, who has obesity and who is a male over uh, 65 years old, he's 74 years old, we want to look at around day seven to 10, that downward turn that we often see in coronavirus patients, uh, where they seem to be doing better. They're, they have even mild symptoms, and then they take a downward turn. This can often uh, manifest itself with breathing issues again, or sometimes cardiac manifestations, even strokes. So uh, part of that is due to the virus. Uh, oftentimes we also see sort of that immune overactivity occurring later, uh, which can also lead to things like more you know, stroke, neurological issues, again, worsening breathing. And then ultimately, we don't know what long haul symptoms um, Donald Trump may experience. So, you know, he's at risk for those as well, being that um, he's older, uh, he's not particularly fit. We see in uh, even young, healthy people, those long haul symptoms. So it's really, really important that around day seven and day 10, uh, we're really keeping an eye on his symptoms. And of course, we won't know as long as they keep saying he's fine, he's having, you know, only mild symptoms at this point. He also got such a heavy cocktail of medications. What are the side effects of those medications? You know. How how are they going to impact somebody like him? Again, all questions that remain to be answered. As you know, doctor, the vice presidential debate between Senator Kamala Harris and Vice President Mike Pence is tonight. They will be shielded from each other by a plexiglass screen. Uh, there was some back and forth between the two campaigns as to whether or not they wanted them. Uh, reportedly, the Harris camp uh, did. The Pence camp did not. Uh, given that the vice president's, one of the members of the vice president's team tested positive for the coronavirus several weeks ago. She's now, of course, uh, healthy. But now her husband, Stephen Miller, has tested positive. He has been testing negative over the past couple of days. But the fact that Stephen Miller tested positive yesterday, 
Isn't it better to be safe than sorry um, when it comes to the coronavirus? This notion that uh, they resisted when, in fact, uh, you see so many members of the Trump inner circle and now members of the military, for example, uh, coming down with either quarantine or infections. Um, wouldn't it just make sense to be to take an extra precaution? Yes, absolutely. That's the greatest, you know, message that should be out there. And I'm shocked that there's any debate about this. There are, it's not just Pence. It's the team that he's traveling in. It's the exposure that they get just at, on a daily basis, just because he's had a daily antigen test, they said, an intermittent PCR test is meaningless. If he continues to interact with other people on his team or anybody else in the world, we don't know what their COVID status is. Um, so at any point, we know somebody can get infected with the virus. It's only been uh, a, not even a week since, you know, everybody has come down with these uh, infections around the White House. Uh, you know, I think there's still definitely a risk here. And the mask and the plexiglass is just two pieces of the puzzle. We need to make sure that there's good ventilation in that uh, auditorium. Ideally, this debate should have been over Zoom or should have been outside. Uh, there are a lot more risk factors here than just Pence has had negative tests. And of course, we don't even know when was the last PCR test. Uh, so I just think more layers of protection here are so important. And the fact that there was any debate about that, uh, just these extra layers is kind of ridiculous. So the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington has a model that is now predicting that 2,900 Americans will die daily from COVID-19 by the year's end. That's a 25% increase, right? It's higher than the number of Americans who were dying during the worst stretch of the pandemic, which is in the springtime. So I want to get from you, you know, what do you make of those numbers? You know, why would this particular model predict an uptick in deaths in the coming months? Yeah, so this model really looks at if we continue, you know, across the country in a way to sort of disregard uh, measures like wearing masks, social distancing, um, and you know, sort of reopening our country in a very aggressive way. And that's what we would expect, that really alarming number of cases and deaths. Now, if you readjust the model uh, for aggressive mask wearing, aggressive social distancing, that number comes down considerably. And, you know, Dr. Fauci just said this yesterday, that uh, we could see a huge turnaround in our daily case numbers in the United States if we just be super aggressive about those steps. Uh, as we move into the cooler months and people are spending more time inside and a lot of states are even opening up their bars at more, and, I mean, restaurants at limited capacities. These are things you really have to worry about. You know, what's the ventilation like in indoor scenarios? So those are all the factors. Those social dynamics are all the factors that are playing into how this, how we can fare with coronavirus over the next few months in terms of cases and deaths. You know, doctor, it always sort of gets me that we, we talk about all this high tech stuff, right? High tech testing and, and this vaccine, it's cutting edge medicine and all that sort of stuff and therapeutics. And really it just comes down to this low tech, regular stuff, the advice your mom gave you when you were six, wash your hands, you know, cover your face, don't, don't get too close to people. It's really the basic stuff that we have to keep repeating over and over again that will make a difference. Dr. Nita Ogden, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.